I'm gonna to talk today about design systems and how they can hopefully help you maintain product sanity. All right, uh, are there any designers in here? Anybody? Raise your hand if you work with designers. Raise your hand if you've had uh, the battle with designers where you get the feedback that says something's like one or two pixels off and then you wanna throw things at designers, right? I would advise against throwing things at designers. They don't like that. It's not. It's not a thing that they're really cool with. So I have spent the bulk of my career doing very similar things, and that's where design systems come in. So what I'm gonna talk about today, specifically in this time, is what design systems are, and if you need one. Uh, spoiler alert for number two, the answer is yes. Um, this talk was originally a little shorter, but then Barry's like, hey, can you talk more? And I was like, that's the easiest request I've ever gotten in my life. So we're gonna totally do that. So this is where we're starting and throwing back to my original question. Some of y'all have been here, right? Most of us are down here in this quadrant. For the younger folks, this is an awesome Atari video game that was the height of video game technology in 1983, uh, or maybe even earlier. Uh, this is combat, and for most of my career when I started out, I worked in marketing and I was working with really talented graphic designers who really knew how to make posters and magazine pages but didn't necessarily know how to do websites. This was new, you know, it's the late 90s, early 2000s, we were still figuring it out. I got a lot of Photoshop files, and I don't know if you know this, but the name is Photoshop, not web page shop. So it's optimized for dealing with photographs. And so they send that in to me as the developer, and I'm in this heated battle where I'm fighting back and forth and if I hear this is one pixel off one more time because I can't see it because I'm a developer and I'm used to looking at the terminal all day, I'm gonna scream and I did scream a lot. And ultimately as our tools progressed, this got a little bit smoother and now I find myself doing this where I'm on the other side and I'm talking to developers and trying to convince you not to throw things at your designers because there are tools that will help you with this communication. That's where concepts like design systems come in. At a high level, that's what a design system is. It is kind of this. My uh, uh, Babblefish fans, I completely just drew a blank on the name of the book. Did you watch that happen? Did you see my brain just go blank? As I was like, what is the name of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy book? <laughs> it's the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. That's what I just forgot. The Babblefish, for those that don't know, is a fish from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you put it in your ear and it translates everything. And essentially, that's what we're going for with the design system, is we're trying to come up with something that is gonna make it easy to talk between the two. So when you have to talk to designers or designers need to talk to developers, being able to bridge that gap is super helpful. I don't do a lot of quotes on slides. I've got a few coming up. Uh, I prefer silly pictures because otherwise I'm just reading to you and this isn't necessarily story time with Sean but for right now we're gonna be that way. So uh, according to Nielsen Norman Group, they have an entire thing called Design Systems 101. I've got a link to it in the slides. Nielsen Norman Group is one of the premier research groups in this area. They spend a lot of time on user experience, user interface design, and they describe a design system in their one-on-one -on -one course as a set of standards to manage design at scale. That is important, the at scale part. By reducing redundancy, that is also important while creating a shared language, circle that, shared language and visual consistency across pages and channels. So this is where project managers, team leads, developer, uh, yeah, senior developers, your junior developers all come in and go, but do we really need this? Do I need all of that stuff? Just give me a picture and I'm gonna make it. How many, I'm gonna go back to show of hands. Raise your hands if you don't start building something until you have a design from the designer. There's a few of you, right? That's how it used to be, right? I don't know what I need to make, so I'm not gonna start making it. Here's a spoiler, you totally can. Particularly if you're building a web app, you're gonna know a lot of the things that are gonna be in there. You've got text, you probably have headers. There's six of them. You're probably gonna use at least three. You might have a hero element. You're definitely gonna have some images. So you kind of know, all right, this is a form. I need to take some input. You don't need to know what it looks like before you can start building it. So the goal of the design system is to do this. It's to create a single underlying system that allows for a unified experience across platforms 
and device sizes. This is from the Google Material Design Guidelines. How many people use MUI? How many people get things from designers where you've made changes to MUI and then you want to do the screaming again, right? MUI uh, is an implementation of Google's material design. This is the language that Google came up with that said, we need to have consistency across all of our apps. We want Gmail and Android and uh, slides, which I'm using now, and all of that to look similar so when you're in there, you know that you're using a Google product. Apple has done this from the beginning and they've done this very well. There is a visual language that screams Apple. You know an Apple product when you see it. Google said, we need to have this as well. They came up with the material design system and this is their reason for doing it. The reason why you may need this and why you do want this is again, I'm throwing back to the original questions of the fights and the battle lines that are drawn between designers and developers. On the left-hand side of the screen, you've got data. This is just a JSON object. Everybody has seen this if they've worked with JSON ever, and it's now in every language because JSON is just like that, and it finds a way to weasel its way in. And ultimately, what this is doing is that this is going to inform this. This is the pretty part. This is the part that the user is going to interact with. This is the part that the designer cares about. This is the part where they're going to tell you that this font size might be off by one or two pixels. But all you care about is this, and ultimately all of this data is going to inform what is in the design. It's going to determine what those graphs are. It's going to determine what is showing to the user and how, where the time should go. All of this, all of the data is going to inform the design. So you can't not have conversations with designers. Sure, everybody in this room, I could hand you this JSON object and you know exactly how to read the time and the power. Great, we're a room full of nerds. You give this to my wife who went to art school, she's not gonna understand a damn thing and she just wants to know what the graphs say. There are lots of people that are like that. The whole world is on the internet, it's not just our nerds now. So this is what we do. We take this, we work with people to turn it into that. And we don't wanna have to have the arguments, we don't wanna have to have the end of the cycle of, I wrote it, give me feedback. I wrote it, give me feedback. I wrote it, give me feedback. How many people have been trapped in that particular cycle before? Design review number five, design review number 72. Final, final, final copy of the final copy, right? We've all been there dealing with that. So you're saying, do we really, really need this? This is, this is so many project managers. When I'm like, we need to have a system, we need to put this thing together, we need a design system, we need this unified language, I give this speech in an abbreviated format where I'm like, just trust me, we really need it, and they're like, but do we? And the argument comes in, when you're building a design system, you're building a tool that builds the tools. It is not the product, I'm gonna to touch on this a little bit in a few slides. The design system itself is not the product, but it is an integral piece of what building the pro uh, an integral piece of the tool set that will ultimately build the product. And particularly, it will help build future products. If you work on a team where you've got different pieces that go across different interfaces, you have a mobile app, you have a website, you may have a TV app. I recently, I just left working for a very large media company. Our interfaces were car radios, Roku, Amazon Fire Sticks, and all of those devices, smart TVs, websites, mobile apps. And so we actually struggled because we had designers that worked across all of those platforms. And then they would come to the web team and they would say, okay, well just do this thing like we did for the mobile app. The mobile app is written in native. It's Kotlin, it's Swift. We don't have all of those features that exist on the mobile app that exist in the browser. The designers don't know that and nor should they because they're just doing design. And so this was a struggle. This was a piece where it's like, we need to come up with this unified language and you had to convince. You will actually save time in the long run if your designers and developers can speak to each other and they know what is and isn't possible across the platforms. So the question really isn't, do we need a design system? The question is, how can I have the conversations that are necessary to have across all of the teams with people who quite literally speak different languages? If you go back to the JSON versus the output, we can read JSON. If you hand that JSON object to most designers, chances are they're not gonna know how to read that. They might have heard JSON, 
We've now progressed a lot more where you've got some other tools where that's not an unfamiliar word, but it's not necessarily something that they know how to read. So we need something that bridges the gap. We need that babble fish that can stand in between the two so that you can have these conversations and everybody maintains their sanity on either side because they're difficult conversations to have. Ultimately, this is what we care about as developers. This is what the designer cares about. They don't care at all what goes into making that brick. They're handing you this thing and going, I need a Millennium Falcon, period, end of story. And so you're looking at this stack of bricks going, how am I going to take this and get it over to there? How am I going to translate? I'm looking at the final picture. Has anybody done, like, have you tried to build Lego kits without following instructions? If you have, you're a lunatic and I'm afraid of you. <laughs> because that's intense. And I've tried to do that and it's a huge mistake. I also try to transform all of my transformers because I'm a 40 year old child uh, without reading the instructions and also that is madness and I don't know how we did that when we were younger for those of us that had transformers when we were younger. So our goal is to say, how do we take our stack of bricks and we turn it into this picture that they gave us? Now here is our ideal scenario and this is actually an interesting new piece to the puzzle. So this is a screenshot of what are known as design tokens in a tool called Figma. Figma literally just came out with this new feature that I haven't actually seen in the wild yet, but they just had their big Figma conference where they have a developer mode built in where they're actually trying to integrate some of these tools to help build that bridge. They understand that what they're doing is that they are creating images that ultimately need to be turned into code and it needs to speak to something that a developer will understand. So they're trying to integrate it and they're trying to make it where you don't end up with file after file after file, version five, final, 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 for real, final, final, maybe hopefully final, dot JPEG, right? They're trying to help mitigate that. So they're actually introducing code generation tools, not let's go to Figma and spit out a React component that a developer is gonna have to rewrite because well, those never work the way that they should. This is creating essentially JSON objects that we as developers can work with. So in an ideal scenario, you've got a designer who can define all of these things in a tool that they understand that then feeds into the pipeline where the developer can write a shared component library. They can push it up to GitHub, publish it to NPM, and then boom, NPM install our rad component and you wash, rinse, repeat. Reality looks a lot more like that because we're not there yet, right? The Figma tokens thing is, again, literally brand new. Like it's within the last two months that they just came out with it. I'm a member of the uh, Design System Slack channel and one of the most popular channels that's on there is this design tokens thing. Designers are having to learn what it is. Developers are trying to learn how to integrate it. When we can crack this particular nut, it will be very nice because again, it's just JSON. We can speak that and then they can work inside of their tools and then you can do things like commit it to repositories. I've got a project I'm gonna show in a little bit where we did exactly that. The designer actually learned enough about committing to Git that he just saves out JSON tokens into a repository that get pulled down into a design system. So right now we're in the middle of a fire because we're still learning and we're still working all this out. Are we leagues ahead of where we were when we were dealing with PSDs? Absolutely. Are there any soldiers of the PSD wars out there that remember slicing them and generating all that stuff? Is there anybody that remembers how hard it was to do rounded corners? Yes, good grief. Eight divs, eight nested divs. I know we've got some boot camp grads in here. Y'all don't know how easy you have it because you can do border radius as a CSS property. That Google sliding doors technique and look at just the pages upon pages of information on how to do that and what a ever loving nightmare it was as you had to slice like little four pixel squares that you repeated as background images and it was the least accessible thing on the planet and God forbid you have a visually impaired user that needs to read your site because someone insisted on rounded corners because it's a mess and it's not gonna be very accessible at all. All right, so this is more the long stuff where I 
talk less quickly. So this is where you want to start from a practical level. The important things are at the top of each of these columns. One is you're going to want to communicate early and often. Really, this entire talk comes down to this. Talk to people, comma, don't be an asshole. Uh, really, that's just good life advice. Talk to people, don't be an asshole. But this is really, really important for this because what happens too often is that we work in silos and we don't talk to our coworkers, we don't talk to the designers, we don't understand. We don't even try to make a stab at learning the language, we just get angry that people don't speak our native language. So what you wanna do is communicate early and often. This next bullet point is actually a big change from the first time I started doing this. The first time I started uh, evangelizing for design systems, a point that I would make is start with your design system. Build your system first, build your tools, then build your application. <laughs> As you will see, after years of trying to do it that way and failing eh, a lot, uh, not quite miserably, but failing frequently, what I realized is that it's actually easier on both designers and developers if you build the product, do an inventory of the product that you built, let that become the thing that builds the tool so that you know what you need going forward. It's build the car, figure out what pieces are gonna go into future cars, then systematize those pieces. So you're gonna to wanna to take a look at what you have and you create your inventory. What sort of things repeat all the time? What things do you repeat over and over and over? And a lot of this you'll notice, like again, when I was back in the PSD wars, a lot of the PSDs looked exactly the same. We had these repeatable elements. This is why you have a lot of developers who want to cut out designers and just go, I'm just going to load with uh, Material UI. I'm going to go load a bunch of Tailwind components because I don't have to talk to designers. Because what has happened is folks have gone out and said, we repeat so many patterns. We all know what a hero element looks like. You know that you've got these repeating things. We know that we see all these things in these libraries that say, you don't need a designer, just go download this you know, and Tailwind's kind of the hotness now, but it was bootstrap back in the day, and Material UI comes up a lot. And a lot of this is, I don't want to have to think about design, I don't have to worry about design, just give me a bunch of sane defaults and I'm good. All of those sane, default, those sane defaults come from this sort of inventory process. We know these things that occur over and over and over, so we can build them in. For your products, for the things that you build, you know what those things are. Sit down with the designers, sit down with the developers, figure out what they are, and you can put them into a system. You're also going to want to start small. Don't go look at the biggest feature that you have. Think of it like test-driven development, right? You want to test the feature, and you start with your unit tests, and you make sure that all those things work, and then you build out your whole feature test, right? Same thing with your design system. You're going to want to start with your small features. What features appear a lot? What sort of things can I repeat? What are the repeatable things? How do these things stack together to go back to the Lego bricks? How many times do I have to combine these bricks in this order, but I need to know what those bricks are before I figure out what they build? And you want to avoid premature optimization. This could be a part of every single talk. Uh, I, I've, I've taught software development for a number of years and this is probably the biggest thing is that you have somebody that gets really, really excited and they jump in and like, we're going to build this and I want to make it the most efficient code possible and I try to explain to them, you've been coding for two months. You're going to write garbage code. I've been writing code for 10 years. I still write garbage code the first time. Do not get hung up on premature optimization. This won't be an issue so much for the designers necessarily, it will definitely be an issue for the developers. So keep that in mind. Again, you want to think of what can I abstract away, which takes us up to the second big point is the form follows function. Again, you can start building your application with zero design. Black and white text on a screen works perfectly fine. And then you can apply the design later. If you know that you've got, I've got a form input, I've got name, email, button, you can build that. And then you can go in and work with your designer afterwards and you can figure out as part of the inventory how to include all of those things and make sure then you're giving the designer the operating parameters that they need to build out these tools. It's gonna take a lot of communication back and forth. You're gonna test, you're gonna iterate, you're gonna test. Definitely test your designs. This is how you make sure that you don't end up in those never ending loops of you're off by one pixel. 
And then remember that the system that you're building is not the product. This isn't set in stone. You are not Moses with stone tablets coming down from on high saying, thou shalt not use this element name. I mean, you might. There's some elements you just shouldn't use. Don't use blink tags. We know that. That's a given. But the rest of this is going to be flexible and it's going to change. And as your product changes, you should iterate your system with the product. Again, you're building the tool to build the tools and not all your tools are going to stay the same. Some are going to improve, some are going to change. You're going to find things that don't work, so you're going to toss them out. Designers normally start here. This is Figma. This is really a great tool. Again, I've made fun of Photoshop a lot because it's a photo editing tool. Figma was designed for building web applications, building mobile applications. You can actually mock up behavior, which is really awesome because, again, from a static photo, I can't tell what something is supposed to do. But if you give me a Figma that's got some animation built in that shows when you click this button, this is how this is supposed to happen, I can build that. I can track that. I can figure out what the keyframe should be. I can do all of that stuff. So usually design is going to start here. Most of your modern designs are going to start here. There are a few other similar tools. Adobe, um, well, Adobe just bought Figma, so that's probably going to phase out their other tool. Envision is still floating around out there. But again, they all are sort of web first tools, which is really nice. You may find some folks that are still using Sketch and Photoshop. That is an entire possibility as well. But most things are going to start here. If you are a developer, you're probably going to want to start with this. Storybook is a JavaScript tool that is plugged into every single JavaScript library you can think of. You can build components inside of it. Essentially, what it allows you to do is build your components individually, small, again, kind of like unit testing. You can put them in a sandbox inside of Storybook where you can mock out all kinds of behavior. You can literally put in what are known as knobs and features that you can make sure that this button doesn't wrap weird when you have weirdly long text that the designer didn't take into account, but you did because you've got to translate your website into German and words go from three letters in English to 25 letters in German because it's a weird language. <sighs> I'm making a joke at German's expense, but that actually really happened. I worked on a website that was uh, predominantly targeting folks in the EU and the number of unexpected things because German words are extra long that came up was ridiculous. And we ended up, I wish we had something like this where we could literally, I could just type the entire alphabet and see how things behave because then we would have had that in the sandbox. So Storybook gives you a sandbox to work in that you can then make sure that the thing you're building behaves the way that the designer designed it. So you can send a working code feature to a designer that will be visual that they can understand they can look at the Figma. They can make sure that the behavior works. The other nice thing is that you can write stories using each of the things. So if you know, OK, this is the button story. This is how this works. How does this button story work with this input? You can write a joint story that combines all of that. So it's a really helpful tool that gives you sort of this non-destructive thing where you don't have to code out the entire application to make sure that the designs are properly implemented. This space is a uh, really popular. Storybook itself is really popular. This is a screenshot from the Storybook website. Uh, I cut off. There's probably another four or five rows below this of organizations that are using Storybook where they are mapping out all of their design systems. If you have ever used Chakra UI and you go to see how to implement their components, you're likely reading their Storybook. They use Storybook to generate all of their documentation on how to use their system, their design system. Now, as I say that, we've got a lot of other things coming along that have sort of piggybacked on what Storybook does. So Zero Height and Knapsack are two big ones. They are specific to design systems. They are kind of implementations of Storybook that are designed to be a little more designer friendly. So they provide interfaces for importing Figma that's a lot easier than Storybook because Storybook is going to live all in code. They also make it really easy to generate documentation with your code. So you put your code in there, you put in all of the behaviors, and they have things where they can just spit out documentation for you so that you don't have to write it. You can write a story, it'll take that story and it'll publish it for you. Uh, there's also a new one that's come along called story2.design. And again, this is, we need to take all the stuff in from Figma, we're gonna turn it into a design system. So it'll generate some of this stuff for you and then as a developer you can come in and adjust the code. And again, none of these are the, just drop your picture in here and we'll give you a fully fledged component that's got just a bunch of garbage written into it that you have to then go in and edit and change. So on the development side, we have a ton of tools, which is equal parts good, equal parts bad. 
because you can end up with paralysis analysis or analysis by paralysis where you have too many tools. But it's also the thing where we're developers and so someone will come along with something and you go, yeah, but I'm going to do this better and then you fork it and you make your own copy of it. So we're dealing with a little bit of that, but in general, we're all following the storybook pattern to get through all of these things. I've tried to do this. This was uh, when I was a car and driver. We worked on building a design system before Storybook. I wouldn't recommend it, hence the, it didn't really work out in the end. Car and driver also changed directions drastically. So this is still floating around on the internet. Nobody at uh, Hearst Autos is using it though. So womp womp. Uh, I also recently worked with a Web3 company to build out. This is uh, a Storybook implementation. This got a little bit closer. This is one of the areas where I turned my opinion around on build it first, then build the products. This one, we learned the hard way that we needed to release the product and then document it from there. I've got a bunch of resources, again, that I will link if you want a copy of these slides, if you want to check a look, take a look at any of those. I've been compiling them and fine-tuning them over the years. And there we go. Finishing out, um, this is a quote that everybody should remember all the time. It's from uh, the voice of Yakko Warner. Laughter is the best medicine is, is the best medicine. And the cool thing is you can't OD and the refills are free. So laugh a lot, particularly at yourself because we're all ridiculous. And thank you.